Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. It, I'm Mary Harry, the APRN that works here at the Smilo Family Breast Health Center here at Norark Hospital. I welcome all of you to the Breast Education Series, and the title of our program tonight is Work and Financial Hardships in Cancer Survivors. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Victoria Blender with us. She is a medical board certified medical oncologist who takes care of patients with breast cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Dr. Blinder is a graduate of Harvard University. She then went on to medical school at the University of Michigan, and she did her residency and fellowship at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell. It's really our privilege and pleasure to have her. She has established a research program on financial toxicity with a focus on employment disparities during and after treatment for breast cancer, as well as the financial and quality of life sequela of these disparities. Um, she has published 15 articles and she was the lead author and she was also part of another 25 articles on this subject matter. And she's also co-authored three articles in textbooks and she's been funded for several studies. She currently is the PI, uh, the principal investigator of breast cancer and the workforce, a multi-center longitudinal observational study of disparities in employment outcomes among African-American, Chinese, Korean, Latina, and non-Latina white breast cancer survivors in New York City. Very data from that study, study led to the development of an NCI funded English Spanish mobile health app. How cool is that? Which is currently being tested to improve job retention in patients undergoing chemotherapy for breast cancer. In addition to her own work, as if she's got time, Dr. Blinder serves the larger oncology community through committee work for the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology. Dr. Blinder is originally from Argentina and she is fluent in Spanish and English. It's our privilege and our pleasure to have you with us. We look forward to the information you'll share with all of us tonight. And again, our apologies for being late. We were having some technical difficulties, but I think we're all back and ready to go. So it's all you, Dr. Blinder. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Eva, um, for welcoming me. And um, can everybody hear me okay? And can you see the slides? Is everything, everything is good? Okay, I am gonna, I'm gonna take that as a yes. Um, great, so um, thank you so much for having me. Um, so um, I just first wanna start with a little bit of background about, um, uh, something called financial toxicity, which is basically, um, uh, oh, okay, um, uh, something that can um, befall cancer patients when they're diagnosed with cancer as a result of um, decreased earning and or increased spending after a cancer diagnosis. So decreased earning can happen if someone loses their job, if they have to go out on unpaid leave, or sometimes if they have um, a pay reduction when they're out on leave. And increased spending, I think most people are familiar with. Um, unfortunately, there are direct costs um, from um, cancer care, including costs for medication, for tests, um, co-pays, but then there are also indirect costs, like um, money spent on travel to and from treatment um, or for child and or elder care if the cancer patient is also a caregiver um, for a child or an, an aging adult. Um, and so this is actually a, um, a, a flow diagram that was developed by a colleague of mine named Scott Ramsey, um, who um, works in Seattle, and he does a lot of work in this area looking at financial toxicity and, and its um, interplay with um, what we call health outcomes, how well do someone does clinically um, after a cancer diagnosis. Um, and um, one of the things that's missing from this diagram, I think it's sort of implied, but I think it really should be explicit, um, is the impact of um, the cancer diagnosis and need for treatment 
on work, including, um, as I mentioned, um, the loss of a uh, job and a decrease or loss of income that can lead to financial strain um, and in the worst case can lead to bankruptcy. Um, and both financial strain and bankruptcy have been associated with inferior work outcomes, uh, sorry, health outcomes with um, patients, for example, um, high, having a higher risk of not being able to complete all their treatment um, and in, in the most severe cases, even um, higher mortality in patients who um, declare bankruptcy, probably because they um, are not able to complete all of their treatment. So um, financial toxicity has been, researchers have kind of separated financial toxicity into three separate domains, sort of um, content areas. Um, one is sort of the material aspects of financial toxicity. So examples of that are problems paying medical bills, paying off bills, needing to pay off medical bills um, over time instead of being able to pay them off right away. Um, there's also the psychological aspect of financial toxicity, which is, um, for example, worrying about paying medical bills um, for an illness or for an accident or even for normal health care. Um, and then there's the behavioral um, domain of financial toxicity. And examples here are delaying or foregoing medical care for financial reasons or going out without going without prescription medicine or follow up care. Um, taking less than the prescribed amount of a, of a medication, for example, to try to save money. So those are all um, behavioral aspects of financial toxicity or financial hardship. Um, so in today's talk, I'm going to um, discuss the risk of prevalence of um, financial toxicity in ca uh, cancer survivors in the U.S., some consequences of financial toxicity, and then we'll move on and focus really on work. So cancer and job loss, some of the um, US policy about cancer and work. Um, we'll talk about disparities in breast cancer associated job loss, which is my main area of research. And I'll tell you a little bit about the intervention that we've developed and that we're now testing to try to promote um, job retention. So what is the prevalence of financial toxicity? How common is it? Um, estimates of the prevalence vary depending on the definition. So more than half of US cancer survivors um, experience at least one domain of financial toxicity. This is going back to the three domains that we discussed um, before in terms of um, material um, uh, uh, and um, behavioral uh, domains. Um, we know that younger age and minority race or ethnicity um, increase a, a person's risk of financial toxicity. Um, and this is likely because these younger patients and uh, minority race ethnicity groups are less likely to have accumulated a significant um, wealth to offset a disruption in work or in their education, essentially disruption in their earnings or disruption in their um, obtaining higher levels of education that will ultimately be associated with um, higher earning potential. And so this is um, a um, chart that was um, published by some colleagues looking at the relationship between age and those three domains of um, financial ducks of financial hardship and they looked at whether people experienced no financial hardship if they experienced one domain two domains or all three domains of financial hardship um, which remembers is material psychological and behavioral and basically what they found is that um, uh, older individuals were more likely to have experienced no financial hardship but younger groups were much more likely to experience at least one domain of financial hardship and really they're more likely to experience um, two or three domains as well um, and then this is another study um, that looked at the relationship between race and financial hardship um, and what they found here if you see in um, blue um, 
white cancer survivors and in yellow black cancer survivors and what percentage experience any kind of adverse financial impact. Um, and then these are sort of the various different aspects of financial um, of adverse financial impacts that could be experienced. And basically for every category, you see that um, black survivors are at higher risk than white survivors of experiencing this kind of financial impact. And so in another study, um, a different group of colleagues did a survey of um, almost 5,000 cancer survivors. And what they found was that 64% worried about having to pay large bills related to their cancer. So that's nearly two thirds really had worries about paying these bills. 40% said that they'd had to make other financial sacrifices in order to pay for the cost of their cancer. About a third said that they or someone in their family had gone into debt because of cancer and 3% said that they or their families had filed for bankruptcy as a result of the cancer diagnosis. So I realize 3% is a small uh, number, but filing for bankruptcy is obviously um, a very, very serious negative consequence. So even a 3% risk um, is um, important and something that um, uh, deserves um, more attention. And so in this study, they also looked at types of out-of-pocket spending among um, the cancer survivors who had reported borrowing money or going into debt because of cancer. And they found that although, um, you know, more than 90% had reported that they had um, out-of-pocket medical costs, 60%, um, so almost two thirds, said that they had to pay significant out of pocket transportation costs, and um, almost a quarter had to pay for lodging, um, with smaller percentages paying for things like childcare or home or respite care. And in this study, factors that were associated with an increased risk of bankruptcy because of cancer, again, included younger age, having a lower annual household income. And again, this is because um, groups with a lower annual income are gonna be less able to offset some of the costs associated with cancer um, or um, loss of income. Being unemployed at the time of the survey, so essentially having lost their jobs or been unable to continue to work, <clears throat> having uh, being publicly insured, um, so having Medicaid or Medicare, um, having at least two cancer diagnoses and um, a longer time since their last cancer treatment. So basically this isn't something that just gets better as time goes on. For some patients, um, the longer it is since they finished their treatment, the higher the risk of um, declaring bankruptcy. So what are some of the consequences of financial toxicity? Well, we know that financial toxicity is associated with decreased quality of life, lower satisfaction with care, um, a higher in, uh, symptom burden. So basically having um, you know, more symptoms like nausea or pain um, and a higher mortality. Um, which is really kind of shocking that, um, at least for me as an oncologist, to know that um, patients who suffer financial toxicity are more likely to die of their cancer. Um, and so what are some of, so again, um, more information about consequences of financial toxicity. Um, a group of investigators looked at a survey um, of um, 1,500 breast cancer survivors in Los Angeles and Detroit. Um, they, about 17% of the um, study sample was black and 40% was Latina. And they found that 12% of the breast cancer survivors in the study reported that they still had ongoing medical debt even four years after their diagnosis. So that's a really long time to carry that kind of debt. 25% um, um, said that they'd experienced a financial decline that they attributed to their diagnosis. And this includes patients with medical insurance and prescription drug coverage. So it's not just um, a problem faced by um, groups that are uninsured. Um, and in this study, blacks were twice as likely as whites to say that within the last year, because of cost, they had either taken less than the prescribed amount of medication or missed doctor's appointments. So again, reasons potentially for 
having um, a higher mortality associated with um, with financial toxicity. And so this in this study, um, that group that I mentioned, the researchers I mentioned in Seattle looked at cancer survivors in Washington state. Um, and they, um, so they looked at cancer survivors and a matched control population. So meaning people who resembled the group of cancer survivors in terms of their general age, kind of where they lived, the zip code of residence and sex. Um, and they cross-referenced the control sample to eliminate people with a history of cancer. So they knew then that the control sample um, had no history of cancer and they compared this control sample to the group of cancer survivors in the study. Um, and they linked the records of both the patients and the controls with the records from US bankruptcy court and they found that actually the odds of bankruptcy were 2.65 um, times higher in patients versus controls, meaning that having a history of cancer increased patients' risk of, develop, of going to clearing bankruptcy 2.65 times. Um, again, factors associated with bankruptcy included younger age, um, female gender, being non-white, um, and having um, localized disease, basically being diagnosed with cancer that had not spread um, outside of the site of origin um, as opposed to metastatic disease. Um, and then they actually looked um, at this same group of cancer patients and looked, um, followed them out and looked at mortality. And so here they found that the risk of death was almost double among cancer patients who filed for bankruptcy compared to those who did not. And again, we think that that is related most likely to not being able to get all of the cancer treatment um, because of concerns about cost. So now moving on to um, thinking about cancer and job loss, which again is a key cause of financial toxicity. So we know that in the US about 46% of new cancers are diagnosed in people who are considered at the classic working age between 20 and 64. And overall about 54% of working age cancer survivors are working full time when they're diagnosed. Um, uh, I'm sorry, not when they're diagnosed, are working full time after, after treatment. Um, we also know that about 70 to 80% of cancer patients who are treated with curative intent, so people who are treated, um, who's, you know, usually these are people who have surgery for cancer and then they may or may not need chemo, um, and then they finish their treatment and they're sort of generally considered to um, be cancer free. Um, so 70 to 80% of those return to work or continue to work um, after they finish their treatment. Um, and this includes patients with a variety of different cancer diagnoses. Um, some of the factors associated with having a lower likelihood of working include having more advanced disease at the time of diagnosis, um, being in a lower income category, and being um, an immigrant or um, an, a racial or ethnic minority. The trajectory of employment after diagnosis can vary, and it can include for some people, some people early retirement, which may or may not be by choice, um, a need to work fewer hours, oftentimes for less pay, um, having to go on prolonged leave, um, and then in some cases, loss of a job. Um, for many survivors, the negative impact of cancer on work is unwanted and results in long-term financial hardship. And we know that 63% of survivors report that they've had to make some kind of change in employment due to cancer. Um, so examples of this include, again, taking extended paid time off, un having to take unpaid time off in 21% of patients, um, and changing from full-time to part-time employment, or even just not pursuing a promotion, which can have a prolonged a, a profound and prolonged impact on someone's um, career. What do we know about U.S. policy about cancer and work? So the U.S. has several um, statutes or laws um, that discuss um, cancer and work. So 
One of these is the Americans with Disabilities Act that says that employers must provide reasonable accommodations to employees with a disability, including cancer. So an example of a reasonable accommodation could be a modified schedule to allow for doctor's appointments um, or special equipment like a chair or a cart. Um, however, an accommodation request may be denied um, if granting it would cause the employer undue hardship. Um, a second law that applies to cancer patients um, is the Family and Medical Leave Act or the FMLA. Um, and this law says that um, patients um, that that um, uh, uh, patients or caregivers um, can take up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave over a 12 month period without risking job loss. Um, so t some important um, facts to know about both of these laws is that small businesses are exempt. So small businesses are exempt from both the ADA and the FMLA. Those with fewer than 15 workers are exempt from the ADA and those with fewer than 50 are exempt from the FMLA. There are um, some state and local laws that are a little bit more generous towards um, patients. Um, but this is what the federal statutes say. Um, and then this is important because this, this small business exemption disproportionately um, affects low wage earners and excludes them from these protections. Um, so 40% of low wage workers in the US are employed by small businesses compared to 20% of workers overall. Um, Cancer patients who can't work can apply for Social Security Disability Income or SSDI. To uh, obtain SSDI, an applicant must be unable to work due to a medical condition that's expected to last at least a year or result in death. And they have to be unable to work in um, their previous, oops, in their previous job or to change to another job. So basically they can't do any work at all. Um, and the, the income provided through SSDI is not very generous. In 2019, the average monthly SSDI was $1,234. Um, so again, not a lot for someone who is um, who does not have sufficient savings um, to offset any kind of decline in income um, and who potentially has a family to support. Another important aspect of US policy is that the laws that govern SSDI discourage workforce re-engagement. So the benefits, the SSDI benefits stop if the person starts working and earns above a certain threshold monthly income. Um, and for example, in 2019, the threshold was $1,220. So if you um, got SSDI, and decided you wanted to, you felt better and you wanted to try working again, if you earned more than $1,220 a month, the SSDI benefits would be would stop. And not only would they stop, but if you wanted to resume benefits, you have to reapply. And that application process can take up to a year. So this means that patients who receive SSDI and plan to re-enter the workforce have to be totally sure. They have to be 100% certain that they will be able to work or else they lose, they risk losing um, these uh, benefits. Um, and so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the research I've done looking at disparities in breast cancer associated job loss. Um, so in a um, group of women from California who had a new diagnosis of stage zero through three breast cancers, so stage zero is DCIS or ductal carcinoma in situ, um, or they could have stage one, two, or three breast cancer. Um, the, we, this group was uniformly low income, so they had to earn less than 200% of the federal poverty level, um, which is essentially a population that's generally covered under Medicaid. Um, they had to be medically underserved in, in terms of their insurance, again, Medicaid generally. Um, they had to have been working at the time of diagnosis and they had to speak either English or Spanish. And the group included 179 Latina and 111 non-Latina white. Uh, breast cancer survivors. And we did telephone interviews at 6, 18, and 36 months after diagnosis. Um, and then here are some more sample characteristics by ethnicity groups. So we found that almost 60% of Latinas had not finished high school compared to only 12% of non-Latino whites in the sample. 
Um, 56% of Latinas worked in service jobs and 24% worked in manufacturing compared to 32 and 5% of non-Latino whites respectively, um, which is important because those jobs are usually associated with decreased access to work accommodations. Um, and we found no groups, uh, no differences in terms uh, of the two different groups in terms of the distribution of cancer stage of diagnosis, the kind of surgery they'd had for their breast cancer, whether or not they got chemo, um, how many other um, comorbid conditions, so how many other medical problems they had, or their baseline quality of life. And what we found was that six months after diagnosis, about half as many Latinas as non-Latino whites had gone back to work. By 18 months or a year and a half, the difference was still significant, but it was, you know, closed, the gap was closing. And by three years, um, there was no statistically significant difference, meaning 53% versus 59% is within the margin of error. Um, and um, both groups, therefore, um, were working in approximately equal numbers. But neither group return to work at the 80% rate that's been shown in wealthier, primarily white um, groups. And so we, you know, we wondered kind of why that could be and started looking at some um, potential predictors. Um, we looked at um, what factors were associated with employment status at 18 months. So that time point at a year and a half um, after diagnosis when there was still a statistically significant difference between the groups. And we found that um, for not for the whites, the non-Latino whites, um, the their emotional well-being, quality of life was associated with working or not working. For Latinas, um, which was a, a larger sample, so we were able to kind of look at additional factors. We found that both physical and emotional um, quality of life were associated with working. Job type was associated with workings, and this again is important because. Um, working in manufacturing was um, the biggest risk factor in terms of job type um, for job loss. And although only like less than 5% of non-Latino whites had worked in manufacturing at diagnosis, almost a quarter of Latinas worked in manufacturing. And then having had a more extensive surgery in the axilla and the armpit um, was associated with um, decreased um, job retention or higher rates of job loss among Latinas. Um, and this is important because it seemed like maybe, although the procedure, equal numbers of the two groups had the procedure, um, it seemed like only for the Latinas did it really interfere with their ability to keep working. And possibly that could be due to differences in terms of um, clinician education of patients about risk of lymphedema or an access to um, services like um, physical therapy and occupational therapy. So we found in this study that low-income women take longer to return to work and do so at a lower rate than middle and higher income women. Um, and this, it seemed based on these findings that maybe low income is a proxy for something else that prevents women from returning to work. So maybe, you know, some of the differences that we've seen in terms of the laws that protect workers um, and that disproportionately leave low income workers unprotected could be at play here. Um, and importantly, the low income Latinas um, uh, may take longer to, to return to work than um, low-income non-Latino whites, possibly due to differences in job type and access to rehabilitation services. So we looked at the same population um, following them out for five years, and here we found that um, more than a quarter never went back to work. So looking out at five years, 27% had never re-entered the workforce. We tried to identify what were the predictors, the risk factors for not returning to work, for basically never returning to work. And um, we found that being in the lowest annual income group, having another medical problem other than breast cancer, um, being Latina, and having received chemotherapy, all were associated with um, not re-entering the workforce. And so here you see um, the group that received chemotherapy is in red, and the group that didn't get chemotherapy is in blue. And you see that all the way out, five years after diagnosis, 
the group that did not get chemo or the group that got chemotherapy doesn't catch up to the group that did not get chemotherapy, meaning that chemotherapy seems to exert a really prolonged impact and prolonged negative impact um, on this patient population. So we concluded from the study that very poor women who take time off from work during chemo can have a difficult time re-entering the workforce. Um, and this could be because low income is a proxy for workplace characteristics like working off the books, for example, um, which is associated with decreased accommodations at work, lack of access to sick leave, paid or unpaid, and disability leave. And in this setting, chemotherapy can have a pronounced effect where women who intend to stop working temporarily can be at risk of exiting the workforce permanently. And I know we're a little bit short on time, so I'm going to just try to go through quickly some of the other slides. So here, um, this is a study that we did in New York City where we looked at women with a new diagnosis of stage one, two or three breast cancer. Um, almost all of the women in the study underwent chemo or and or radiation therapy. Um, and we looked at post-treatment work status, which we defined as working either full-time or part-time um, four months after they finished all of their active treatment, meaning chemo or radiation. Um, uh, but they could still be getting hormonal therapy or um, HER2-targeted therapy. Um, and in this study, we tried to control for disparities in secular trends. So secular trends meaning things like the background unemployment rate. So for example, we know that when unemployment in the US goes up, um, the rate of unemployment goes up more for minority groups and low income groups. Those groups are more likely, they, they suffer disparities in um, these secular trends like unemployment, so they're at higher risk. And so we needed to be able to control for that so that if we found that um, low income um, or minority groups were at higher risk of job loss after a breast cancer diagnosis, we could distinguish between causality if that was caused by the need for treatment for breast cancer or if it was, you know, potentially just caused by background, whatever was happening in the economy at that time. And so we had a control, um, we controlled for those kinds of um, uh, background factors by asking patients to tell us about the work status of a friend or family member um, and report on that work status moving forward as they completed their surveys. Um, and so in all, 702 women finished baseline surveys and 488 women completed follow-up surveys four months after they finished their treatment. Um, I'm gonna quickly go through basically just to highlight that this is a very diverse sample in terms of race, ethnicity, in terms of immigrant status. Only 42% were born in the US, about a third um, were low income um, and with a variety of job types. Um, this is, these are the cancer um, clinical and treatment characteristics of the sample. And basically we found that four months after finishing their treatment, 71% of the participants were working, but their work status differed across race ethnicity groups. So 72% of black women, 65% of Chinese women, 68% of Korean women, 62% of Latino women, and 90% of non-Latino whites um, were still working four months after completion of their treatment. Um, then we looked at the controls, basically the friends or family members um, that patients had reported on. And we found that for the controls, 90% were working. And so we calculated this ratio of working patients versus working controls to see um, are these differences that we're finding in terms of post-treatment work status because of differences in the impact of cancer treatment or because of you know, possible fluctuations in the economy that we know affect minority groups disproportionately. And basically we found that was so we calculated, calculated the ratio of working patients versus controls for each race ethnicity group. And you see that um, the, you basically to determine that um, a group was disparately, disproportionately impacted negatively in terms of their work status by cancer and its treatment, we would have to see that their, um, that the, the 
ratio is different from the ratio for non-Latino whites, which was the reference group, um, and that this thing, which is called the 90, the confidence interval, sort of the margin of error of the test, does not overlap. And so you can see that for the Black, Chinese, and Latino groups, these numbers are different. So 0.78 is different from 0.98, and the confidence interval does not overlap here. So the Korean group had a very small sample size, which is, I think, responsible for the overlap that you see here, um, sort of this kind of flaw in, in the study where we weren't able to recruit enough um, women to that sample. Um, but overall, the bottom line is that there does seem to be a disparate impact of cancer treatment on minority women um, in New York City. And then here we looked at um, independent predictors of not working four months after um, treatment completion. And importantly, we found that um, although um, you know, race, ethnic, and minority groups and low income groups were at higher risk of job loss, so the higher risk means if the odds ratio is greater than one, we found that um, having an employer who was not accommodating, so saying that the employer had not been accommodating, was also associated with um, higher risk of job loss. And so turning that on its head, we asked, well, what if we could improve access to accommodations? Is that something that we could do to try to improve job retention, um, regardless of race, ethnicity, group, or income status? Um, so let, we're going to come back to that in a second, and, um, and I'll just highlight the conclusions of the study, which were that breast cancer exerts a disparate negative impact on work status for women who are either low income um, or um, minority race or ethnicity. And it seems like this difference persists after controlling for disparities in non-cancer unemployment. Um, and um, so job loss is a financial toxicity of chemotherapy that can have um, profound long-term consequences. Um, prior research indicates that a failure to re-enter the workforce early predicts prolonged job loss. So you can see that not going back to work early can lead to long-term um, financial consequences for patients. Um, however, improving access to employer accommodations could be a promising therapeutic target um, to um, abrogate or, or um, attenuate job loss. And this could be especially important for minority and or low income women who undergo chemo. And so based on these findings, we developed an intervention that's called teamwork or talking to employers and medical staff about work. Um, the goal of teamwork is um, it's based on this idea that disparities in work accommodations are a critical barrier to job retention um, and um, asking if we could improve self-confidence to ask for accommodations, if we could teach women how to negotiate for and obtain accommodations at work, could they um, improve their um, ability to continue to work um, uh, and uh, go back to work after treatment. And so um, the intervention is a mobile health app. It's available in English and Spanish. Um, and it, again, improves patients' ability to obtain the accommodations they need. It gives them suggestions for what kinds of accommodations could be helpful. And it helps them um, optimize their symptom control during chemo so that they're um, better able to keep working. Um, it was developed with input from a variety of different groups, including cancer survivors. Um, it includes information about um, and advice, um, including suggested accommodations tailored to specific job tasks and ongoing deficits, um, information about legal protections for patients, um, coaching about negotiation and communication, including sample videos and prompt lists for kinds of questions and, and suggestions for things to ask for, um, symptom self-management strategies, including a tracker that they can use to better communicate with the clinic team, and then some additional features based on participant feedback, including a calendar and a place to organize notes. And these are just some screenshots of an early version of the app. Um, Whereas so here, for example, we asked patients to answer a couple of questions about 
um, what their job entails, and then based on their answers, we give them um, some tips for things that they can do um, or equipment that they can request um, in order to um, be better um, able to do that part of their job. Um, and so we are currently doing a randomized controlled trial of the Teamwork app where we're measuring its effectiveness as a job retention tool compared to an informational brochure. Um, and I think that this is my last slide um, where I want to thank all of you for listening and um, thank all of our study participants and our funding sources. And then my last slide, um, this is so I throughout the talk, I think you might have noticed some of the car the photos that are basically um, Library of Congress photos, um, sort of Bruzy the Riveter era um, photos from World War II. Um, and then this is a cartoon from the same era that says grandma's never absent now that they let her do all her own baking at the plant, which I thought was um, a um, cute take on work accommodations, um, allowing someone to continue to work. Um, I am going to have to do something slightly unorthodox because I'm getting paged by the emergency room about a patient of mine. So if it's OK, I'm just going to mute myself and call them back and then I will be right back with you. Is that all right? OK, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions that anyone may have. I have a couple of thoughts and questions myself. Is there anybody who's got something they'd like to share? I think we'll go ahead and wait then for Dr. Blinder to get back and then if anybody has anything, they can send it in the chat or they can just go ahead and speak up. I guess I'm going to just add a couple of comments while we're waiting for Dr. Blinder to come back. And that is certainly, you know, we certainly encourage women to work while they're getting chemotherapy. And I think maybe what we need to do is continue to follow up with them to see how that's going while they're in the middle of chemo. Um, and then how we could possibly help with that. Okay. Yeah. Hi. I'm sorry about that. Hi. So um, I guess let's just have a little discussion back and forth for the last couple of minutes. I, I'm sure the questions may be coming, but I'm just not seeing them on the link that we're in. And I know this is being recorded, so we'll just go ahead and share this with people down the road. But the two areas that I kind of picked up on was patients that have had lymph nodes removed. You know, we have been doing less and less in the, mm -hmm. since the 2011 study that said we don't have to take so many lymph nodes. So that's maybe not that big of a concern, but I guess we probably need to really focus on that and say, all right, let's make sure they're getting to OTPT and getting that full range of motion back. I and think it's that, and I also think that, um, and, and this is not, it's something that, you know, I've started to look at, but I don't really have a lot of data, so some of this is my, just my impression, but I also think that there's a lot of misinformation about what kinds of restrictions um, patients need to have, and so I think that sometimes there's like an over emphasis on restrictions that might not be necessary, and that can then, um, you know, negatively impact someone's ability to work. So I think it's a combination of those two things, like access to rehabilitation services and then education about what what is safe and what isn't safe. Completely agree. And, you know, we used to say, oh, you know, you've got to wear a glove, you've got to wear a sleeve. Don't be doing exercises. Don't go to the gym. And we've partnered up with the area YMCA so people can go for three months. And we really encourage people to get back to their activities two weeks after surgery. One of the things that people don't realize that I think is key is the link between weight gain and lymphedema. So yeah. basically, and, and that in fact, 
trying to avoid weight gain and the progressive resistive exercises actually decrease risk of lymphedema. And yeah. so, you know, this whole thing of like avoiding exercise is actually shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah. Completely agree. Completely agree. Well, and it's a reminder, more education that probably needs to be brought up at every mm -hmm. visit. And if it yeah. doesn't, if it's not a, a real instruction mm -hmm. piece at the visit, maybe there needs to be something in the exam rooms to be reminded. Exactly. So exactly. Great, great reminder. And then that whole chemo piece, again, so significant. Yeah, I mean, so I'm not going to suggest we stop giving women chemo because of the risk of job loss, but I do think, so one thing that, you know, and I was trying to rush through the slides a little bit because I knew, like, I, you know, we, we were short on time, but, um, you know, one of the things that we really kind of honed in on a little bit more that I don't think came out in the talk is that um, it seems like a big reason why women lose their jobs if they get chemo is that if they they might choose, they might try to stop working for a little while if they can't get the accommodations they need and then try to re-enter the workplace if you didn't have, if your job wasn't held for you. So if you didn't have FMLA, for example, um, if you didn't have a boss who just said, oh yeah, I'll wait for you or who would be able to wait for you, that is, you know, that's key. So the example I always give, you know, so I'm a mom, I have an eight year old, I have a nanny. If my nanny came to me tomorrow and said, I need to take six months off or four months off for chemo, there's no way that I could do, you know, that I could, accommodate that because I work too, right? So there's no way that I could go without. But if if she said to me, you know, I'm going to be going through chemo and I'm going to need a few days off every few weeks for treatment and recovery. And in between cycles, I'm probably going to be pretty tired and not feeling 100%. So maybe we can't go to the park every day or maybe we can't, I, you know, I have to slow down a little bit. But, you know, I'll keep working, then of course I would do everything I could to try to accommodate that coverage for her, you know, all of these things. And so that kind of negotiated um, solution is really what the app is trying to help people arrive at because there's, I don't think, you know, we're not going to change policy. We're not in Europe. They have a lot more, you know, support for people who, for example, need to take time off and then need to re-enter the workforce gradually. We don't have that in this country. And so, you know, make of it what you will and, you know, however you might feel about it, that's just the reality that a lot of patients face. And so it's either you work or you don't work. And if you don't work, and you're not in a job that is going to be held for you, then you really r risk kind of being shut out of the workforce afterwards. Um, and so that's really what we're trying to avoid. Sure, because you don't then with the idea of going back to work and you don't have your full energy anyway, and you've got to be expected to perform right. is Hercules. Right. You're, it's a catch-22 for sure. You need to be able to negotiate. You need to be able to advocate in a way that is going to um, you know, so one of the things that we talk about is like this idea of negotiation and kind of how you approach the negotiation, how you go into it in order to show your employer that you're considering their interests as well, which is so important in terms of, you know, being able to get what you need in order to keep working. Well, and it's giving them the words, right? Because uh, you know, if you don't really have that language or even have thought about it. It's, right. Most of us don't learn how to negotiate, women especially. Right. Yeah. Right. Great tips. Great tips. And that app sounds like it's pretty cool. Is it easy to use? People are... I think it's easy to use. We did a lot of um, testing before we um, opened the study, um, you know, kind of live. Um, and so when we got really good feedback, so I think it's I think it's easy to use and I think it, it will be helpful. So, you know, time will tell, um, but um, but I'm really hopeful that that it will be that it that it will help a lot of women. And I think the other piece is being able to share with your healthcare team your symptoms that you're having and being really able to manage those because you probably could go to work if you didn't have any nausea. You could probably go to work if the fatigue wasn't so bad. You know, what are some of the things? Maybe they are manageable, maybe they're not, but wouldn't it be great to at least know that up front? Absolutely, exactly. Oh, that's key, that's key, key. 
Well, thank you. Anything else you think we should hit upon in the last minute? Any um, so if, if you're going to post the talk on the you know on the website or anything like that, um, I um, would be happy to give you a list of websites that I think have really good information for patients um, and caregivers. And actually the, the best one um, I can tell you right now is called Cancer and Careers. If you Google yes. Cancer and Careers, you'll get to them. Uh, they are an excellent, excellent organization. You know, we partnered with them um, for some parts of the app um, and I give talks with them um, as well. And, you know, I think they have so much to offer for patients, for um, employers who are just seeking to, you know, get more information on how they can help um, their employees um, and for clinicians too, for doctors and nurses and social workers who, you know, maybe need to find out more about how they can help their patients. Great, excellent. Yes, we'd love the other websites that you might have, and we'll certainly share those with our audience. And we look forward to meeting with you again, perhaps next year with an update on what other things are going on. And we thank you so much. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.